Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. It's time for Off the Press, where we take you through the front pages of our national dailies and bring you up to speed with the big stories making the rounds. Tunde Kolawale, a legal practitioner, is on standby. He joins the conversation in no time. Good morning, Tunde Kolawale. Good morning, my sister. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for joining us. Merry Christmas. All right, let's start off with the... Uh, paper this morning, the daily independent newspaper, as always, would be looking at some of the big stories on the daily independent. The banner caption says, patronage of POS deeps as customers return to ATM others. World Bank cautions Nigeria against hiking electricity tariffs. And that's underneath the bold caption. You are suffering loss of memory. Obasan draw fires back at Edwin Clark. Insist crude oil other resources belong to Nigeria. 2023 elections. Governor Masari reaffirms support for power shift to south. Edwin Clark calls out Lai Mohammed, asks him to build bridges. Says Jonathan flushed out Boko Haram from 14 Boronu local governments, not Buhari. Talking about security concerns. Attack on PDP Congress in Zamfara, assault on democracy. That's what the party is quoted to say. Says no amount of... I, I like to take the ride again. Says no amount of uh, machines will save APC in 2023. 2023 presidency, Southeast leaders endorse AIM. And all set for Buhari to sign 2022 budget into law. Friday, mandatory direct primaries to costs or too costly for Nigerians. That's what the president is quoted to say. And just before we move away from the Daily Independent, another caption here says, FCT minister assures on helping next supermarket regain footing. Uh, this are some of the headlines on uh, the Daily Independent newspaper. Let's move away from the Daily Independent and check out the leadership newspaper this morning. On the front page of the leadership newspaper, Southeast political bigwigs eyeing 2023 presidency, and you have uh, a picture to that particular effect. I don't hate Niger Delta, former president Olusegun Obasanjo replies Edwin Clark. Husband, two wives, son die in Niger boat mishap and FCTA to revoke titles of 1,035 abandoned buildings and plots. Justify your promotion, Ami tells new generals. Direct primaries will be financial burden to parties. Presidency insists. Says only APC PDP will benefit. President Mohamed Buhari signs 2022 budget on Friday. And you have four months to deadline, 11 PFAS battle to meet 5 billion naira recapitalization. Now, and this is some of the headlines uh, on the leadership. We'll move away from the leadership now. And uh, let's take a look at what the punch has to say. Uh, still talking about the elections and uh, 2023. You have the banner caption saying, 2023 electronic transmission of results doubtful. 301 local governments lack internet facilities. That's on page two. And you also find underneath the caption, only 473 local governments have internet access. Federal government plans additional 224 local governments by 2023. Experts say satellite technology can cover local government without internet. INEC can use other platforms where internet is not available. Uh, find out who's saying all of that, but these are some of the writers underneath the board caption. National Assembly sends appropriation bill to Buhari. President signs Friday, hopefully. And you also find federal government set to disclose 2022 marginal oil field bid round. Disco suffer load reduction as power generation shades 571.5 megawatts and 15,049 Nigerian nurses moved to the United Kingdom in five years. This is according to reports. I'm sure you want to find out what that's about. 
Away from that, Auditor General Queries Ministries, 3.8 billion naira spending from suspended RUGA fund. Reps debates bill to end uh, widow, husband, and brothers force marriages. Uh, that's also another headline you find on, on the Punch newspaper this morning. And still looking at it just before we move away. Uh, Ayade Mons as ex-Senate president wires widows dies in the United Kingdom. Imo kicks as Okoroche's son in law tackles Uzodima and false arrests. Well, this is some of the headlines on the punch. Uh, let's move away from the punch newspaper this morning and also check out the nation newspaper. Now, the nation newspaper, the banner caption, all belongs to Nigeria, not Niger Delta, says uh, former president Olusegun Obasanjo might just be dominating all of the headlines, and that's uh, generating a lot of conversations across board. Ex-president tackles Edwin Clark, a BNO grudge against region. Outrage in Nigeria, others as uh, push oil price to 80 barrel. Uh, you have that per dollar. Uh, that's also another caption you find here. Ex-president guilty in mother of nine Nigerians. COVID-19, WHO can meet 40% global vaccination target. Biosa spill, abrupt wellhead leak impossible without interference, experts actually insist. Uosu, I was accused of supplying arms to militants and uh, palace. Two vehicles touched after Oshun Carnival. Uh, this is some of the caption you find this morning on uh, the Nation newspaper. Well, we just head straight to the conversation now, and starting with the big story now, uh, we have Tunde Kola Wale, uh, who joins the conversation. Once again, thank you for being part of the show this morning. We appreciate. It. Thank you, my sister. Okay, so um, let's let's get your reaction on you know the big story that's dominating the papers the papers this morning. All wells uh, belongs to Nigerians, not just the Niger Delta, according to the former president Olusha Gunobasanjo. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, honest, honestly speaking, I would not have expected President uh, Lucia Kwapasa to have said that. Knowing how sensitive the issue of oil leaks in Nigeria today, but with that as it may, technically speaking, and under the law, President Kwapasa is merely restating the obvious. If you look at the 1963 Constitution, which most people are clamoring for its return, and if you also look at uh, the 1999 Constitution as amended that we are practicing today, you will find out that oil is on the exclusive legislative list. And whatever is on the exclusive legislative list, is under the domain of the federal government. And whatever is under the domain of the federal government belongs to all Nigerians as a whole. The state, the local government, cannot legislate, cannot take any action, cannot appropriate the oil on their own without the concurrence of the federal government. So if this is the case, we could say that President Olusha Kwapasa John is right. But what about the position of equity? You and I do know that even though the whole Nigeria has been exploiting these oil resources since 1959, the people under whose soil the oil has is being dug out or is being drilled. What have they benefited from it? Their environments are being polluted. Gas is being flared. Causing enormous heat in the atmosphere. Their lands are not developed. They are not drinking water. And all manners of diseases are rampant in places where oil is being prospected. So if that is the case, should we as a nation 
not have made and be implementing laws that will ensure that the people of the Niger Delta derive equitable benefit from the oil that is dug from their ground. Rather than do that, we have been persecuting them, we've been sending soldiers to them to kill and maim their people when, when they protest against environmental degradation. You will remember how Nigeria quietly dealt with Kensarowiwa, a native of, eight of, eight of his opponent uh, uh, compatriots. Whereas that ought not to have arrived. Take, for example, if we had made sure we build good schools in the Niger Delta, we provide uh, free accommodation to all the people where oil is being prospected. We make sure that they have drinking water. Some of the agitations that we have in the Niger Delta today will not be there. So I will conclude that President Ushia Kompas and uh, statement, even though it may be right, is highly insensitive and totally uncalled for from an elder statement like uh, President Ushia Kompas and No how inflammable, no how touchy, how the people of the Niger Delta feel with regards to the injustices that have been done to them with regard to the oil that has been taken away from under their soil. All right, um, let's also look at the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. Mandatory direct, pri uh, direct primaries too costly for Nigerians. Uh, that's what the presidency is saying. Do you think that we probably might just get over it because this particular clause might just be, you know, be a serious delay for the passage of that particular bill, and which might yeah, not yeah, yeah. allow us to, uh, you know, enjoy the benefits of electronic transmission of results come 2023? The issue of direct primary for men, I would think, has been blown out of proportion. Why do I say this? The National Assembly people that proposed this direct primary thing, what they doing it with an altruistic purpose? Are they doing it for the benefit of the average Nigerian voter? The answer is no. They are proposing the direct primaries because the governors have always been an hindrance to some of them seeking the election. They have proposed the direct primaries to curb the excesses of the Godfather at the state and the local level who impose candidates on the party in spite of whether the candidate is popular or not. So that law, in my own opinion, is a law that has been made from the background of an enlightened interest. It is meant to benefit the people in the National Assembly and the people in the respective houses of assembly in the state. Furthermore, I will want to say that the president, in a way, is right in the position he has taken. But why do I say this? I say this because, ordinarily under the law, how the party choose their flag bearer to be the businesses of the parties. It's not a thing that you begin to make a law about. It's not a thing that you begin to put into the electoral act. After all, all the parties that we have in Nigeria today have laws and guidelines as regards how the flag bearer of their parties could be chosen. Under their constitution, some have their race primary, some have consensus candidates, some have the delegate system. I would want to think that it is what best suits any of or any particular political party. That is the method that they should adopt in choosing the flag bearer. But with Mr. President, you could also ask his refusal to sign that law, I mean that bill into law, is it being done 
with the perspective of improving of our electoral act. The answer is no. The president position is also self-serving. He is doing it with the purpose that we will maintain the status quo, that the Godfather will continue to dictate to us who gets the flag of a political party and who doesn't get it. The president has finally called a dog a bad name in order to hang it. I also emphasize that this direct primary thing is not a new thing to us. You will recollect that during the primaries between the uh, Ambote and the present governor Shawo Olu, the direct primary was used in Lagos. Did that direct primary work the way it should be worked? The answer is no. The party with big wigs, the party godfather, those who have the party in their hands, dictated those who have access to the party uh, identity card. And they also dictated which party member has his name on the party register. They also dictated who is given a ballot box to be able to vote during that primary. So what I'm emphasizing from this is this. whether you use a direct primary, whether you use a consensus candidate, or whether you use the, the delegate system, the Nigerian political class has a way of frustrating whatever methods, whatever system, whatever choice you have chosen to select the flag bearers of any political party in this country. And the reason for this is not far-fetched. They don't want the political system to work smoothly and seam seamlessly. Because any time our political system begins to work smoothly and seamlessly, most of the people, most of the people, I repeat, that you have in most of these political offices will never take political power again in this country. Because they are neither popular nor wanted by the people. They are imposed on the people not just by the Godfathers, but by the private armies that the Godfathers have also established. The enforcers, those who insist this is the person that must get the party flag or who must be the party flag bearer, and the private armies of the politicians impose these people on people. Where they are unable to impose them, they make sure that they disrupt whatever system or whatever primaries are put in place to take place in the stronghold of their political opponents. So okay. it is left to the but Nigerian let's also look people. At some other, Tunde Kola, let's also you know, look right. at another issue as well, because uh, All right. uh, it yeah. has to do with the 2023 elections and the electronic exactly. transmission of results. Now, that's according exactly. to the punch now. Uh, electronic yeah. transmission of results doubtful, as 301 local government lacks internet facilities. Um, don't you think at this point in time we probably should have moved away from some of this kind of excuses that we're making right now? And do you see a That's possibility another, of, um, of us having, uh, you know, results electronically transmitted in 2023? That's another lie they are telling the Nigerian people. Will you believe it? That as far back as 1993, Nigeria has been transmitting elect I mean, electoral results electronically. You go and find out the election that the uh, present uh, of uh, or the late TMK uh, Abiola won. Most of the results are transmitted electronically. In fact, as soon as the results are completed in the different polling booths, they are sent to an INEX server in Abuja and the server automatically calculates the results and it is displayed on a TV or in a computer board that is mounted outside the INEC office in which all journalists or whoever is present and all the party leaders have access to. So I was surprised that uh, in 2015 or thereabouts, INEC was telling Nigerian people that they have no servers, that they cannot transmit uh, results, or that the 2015 results were not transmitted electronically. It is a lie. And then they, what they are saying now, 
that certain local governments don't have internet services and what have you. That is another bogus life. It is not through the internet alone that you can transmit the next uh, uh, electoral results. I give you an example. Do you know that the Nigerian army, do you know the Nigerian police, do you know the Nigerian navy, do you know that the Nigerian sailors, those who pilot the ships on water, they have a way of communicating without going through the internet services. They use a radio system. If we have accepted that we want to transmit election results electronically, we could use the Turaya, that is a satellite telephone system, to do it. We could also ask the army to make their facilities available to us to transmit the results. Because the army communicates without using the conventional method. And there are so many other methods on social media and other platforms that can be used to transmit this result. The truth of the matter is that uh, since the APC came to power, they have never organized any free and fair election. And they are not interested in any free and fair election. And they will never be interested in any free and fair election so long as they remain in power. Look at all the local governments that the APC says are conducted. Some will look on that uh, local government but, but, um, uh, Tunde election. Kola Wale. Tunde Kola yeah. Wale. Yes, sir. So, so now that, uh, you know, where, where we are now, the president has not uh, given his assent to the bill. And it, it therefore means that if, with the, with the whole logistics, sending it back, and then it comes back, there might just be, you know, a delay of time. And it might just leave us falling back to the Electoral Act of 2010, which would also keep us in the same position of not being, you know, given the backings, the legal backings to have results transmitted electronically. So, but are, are there, is there anything that we can do to get out of this phase? And do you see a possibility of us, you know, legally having the legal back, backings, uh, you know, to transmit results electronically? No, I don't think so. If we are going to have that, it means that uh, the National Assembly would have to muster to third of their members to override the president's assent. But once the bill gets back to the National Assembly and they have the two-third majority and they debate and still pass it into the law, that bill automatically, that electoral act automatically becomes a law in which the signature of Mr. President is no longer required. But taking into cognizance the antecedents of the President National Assembly, of being a rubber stamp of the executive arm of government, would they have the political will to override the President's assent? The answer is no. What I suspect might happen is that those provisions that the President says is not happy with, they will remove them, they will expunge them, from the new electoral act and then pass it back to Mr. President to sign into law. The contentious areas like the direct primary electronic transfer of results and what happened, they will take all those ones out and send the bill back to Mr. President to sign. And he is most likely to sign that because that is in tandem with his own perspective and enlightened self-interest, so to say as regards what you want to see happen in 2023. The alternative might be that the Nigerian civil society, the Nigerian labor, and then the other free political parties can lobby and begin to put pressure on the National Assembly to override the president's uh, assent to that bill. But like I said, they have never, the National Assembly, I've always never had the boss to confront the president when it comes to issues such as this uh, uh, nature. Okay, um, well, let's also look at another um, issue right here, and uh, yeah. that's on the leadership, where generals have been asked to justify their promotions. 
and that should translate to we seeing result, you know, the entire country being secured against uh, all of these criminal elements. The, the army generals are there? Yes. When I saw the list of promotion, and uh, I'm one of those who is always careful to condemn the servicemen because of the enormous sacrifices that most of them are making to make Nigeria secure. Army generals have been killed in this uh, war against Boko Haram. The ordinary rank and file soldiers have been killed. All these people have wives, they have children, they have relations who are dependent on them. They are dying in a war which they never contributed into creating. They are dying in a war that they know nothing about. So to that extent, I think by and large, they have done well. It is a political class that I would say that have failed woefully the Nigerian army and the security people in general with regards to the winning of this war. Why do I say this? Thanks to that number, I've emphasized that army generals alone don't win wars. Go and check all over the world. Army generals alone don't win wars. And machineries will never win any war for you. In most places that are war, wars have been won in a very decisive manner. It is a civil society. I, some uh, thinkers in the society that usually will team up with the general to divide ways and means, strategy and tactics to win the war. Say, for example, during the World War, the political class approached Albert Einstein. How can we win this war decisively? And Albert Einstein assembled scientists and all that, and they came up with the atomic bomb. And immediately the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That was the end of the war. Japan surrendered. The Allied forces, most of the day, surrendered. When you also look at the history of the war between the Soviet Union and the West, and especially Germany against Hitler, it was a Stalin, Joseph Stalin, and Leon Trotsky, who were not army generals, that led the offensive, that devised the strategy and tactics that led to the winning of that war. Also look at the Nigerian Civil War. It is over the Miawolo War that devised most of the strategy and tactics that led to Nigeria or that made it possible for Nigeria to win that war without borrowing the cover to finance the war. But with that as it may, I will also say I'm not too comfortable with the performance of the army generals uh, despite the fact that they are making enormous sacrifices. Why do I say this? Nigeria today has no business importing bombs. Because if the Boko Haram to manufacture bombs and they are using it and it is effective, they detonate it and use it to kill our soldiers. By now, Nigeria should not be importing bombs. Also look at the AK-47 that cost almost about uh, 2.5 million naira to buy. Nigeria has no business importing any guns. The blacksmiths in Benue State, in Kogi State, in some of the Eastern States, they manufacture AK-47, which is very leather, which is effective, which also uses the conventional ammunition that imported the AK-47 use. So, secondly, too, by now, I would have expected the Nigerian Nami to say we are testing. I would have expected the Nigerian army to, be, to display short-range missiles that their scientists have been able to invent and manufacture. But they are not producing any arms and ammunition. We don't see any ingenuity or creativity in making sure that this country does not depend on the importation of all these arms and ammunition wholesale. You remember only the Nigerian Civil War. 
it was Keith Emmanuel Uwayahu who put a group of scientists together that manufactured what we call the Ubunu Bay, which is a missile which the Biafran were using against the Nigerian army. Emmanuel Uwayahu is an engineer. He still alive. He has the technology. Most of the scientists that he worked with, some of them are still alive. Why can't you call the man in one year to come and uh, give for the expertise that he has with regard to manufacture and production of arms and ammunition? Also, during the Russian, I mean, during the, during the World War, what the Russian people did was to reconfigure some of their industries that were producing civil goods into uh, industries into manufacturing outfits that could produce arms and ammunition. We can also do that in Nigeria. The Kaduna Automobile Industry, Innocent Motor, and then the, the assembly plant in Shagamo there that uh, produces uh, armor vehicle can be reconfigured to produce most of the arms and ammunition that the Nigerian soldiers require to use against the Boko Haram. Right. But Mr. the Palawale, generals Mr. are not Palawale. moving in that direction. They want yeah. to be importing all these arms and ammunition with the purpose of probably enriching themselves, with the purpose of probably using the opportunity to siphon money outside the country and go and use to buy houses and uh, uh, other luxury goods in those places. So, in terms of sacrifice, the armies have made the normal sacrifices, but in terms of creativity, in terms of ingenuity, in terms of determination to win this war record time and with minimal cost, with minimal loss of life, our generals haven't demonstrated any ingenuity at all. Well, um, Mr. Kolawale, I'm, I'm sure that the generals uh, would be able to, or the Nigerian government um, would figure out why it needs them to prove uh, their worth and the reason for their promotions uh, and the likes. Um, um, we'll continue to encourage the Nigerian army um, as much as we can. Uh, good morning to you and uh, good morning to our viewers also. Let's move over to something on the punch this morning that talks uh, healthcare. Right. It says 15,049 Nigerian nurses relocated um, or moved to the UK in five years. Uh, that's from a report. 15,049 Nigerian nor uh, nurses moved to the UK in five years. To Nicola Wale, how much of a problem is that? It is a tragedy for the Nigerian nation. First and foremost, I see it as uh, another second slavery. Yes, those people will be welcome in there. They will render services, but never will they be assimilated as a British citizen, they will forever remain second-class citizens. There will always be a boundary beyond which they can never cross. That is one. Secondly, look at the amount of resources. Look at the time that you used to train a medical doctor, that you used to train a nurse, that you used to train a veterinary doctor. Look at how long it takes. And then, after you have trained them, they now emigrate to some other countries and begin to use their expertise to develop those other countries. No country will sit by and watch that kind of brain drain affecting it on a daily basis. You will recollect that when COVID first started, the British, the Americans sent empty planes to Nigeria here to come and carry nurses, to come and carry medical doctors, to come and carry veterinary doctors. With the aim that when they get to Britain and some of these countries, they will regularize, they will give them this up. I think it was the federal government that distorted that program. But after they have distorted the program, the nurses and doctors have been finding some other ways and means to go to some of these countries. So this is a tragedy on our part. It's a thing that we should not have allowed to happen. But can we stop the young people from traveling abroad when we are unable to give them jobs here? You will recollect there was a medical doctor 
who was driving Uber, a whole medical doctor, he was driving Uber. And some young people hired him, and in the process of him taking them from one place to the other, they attacked this doctor and killed him somewhere in a better there. If that doctor had been our daughter, and if he had gotten a job outside the country, we would have discouraged we would have discouraged him not to go. The answer is no. So if doctors and nurses are immigrating, these are self-inflicted programs. If we had made our health system to operate at the international standard level, these doctor nurses and veterinary doctors wouldn't have been leaving the doctor. I have given this example before. I'm happy to give it again. The University of Adelaide teaching hospital in the battle. Most of the princes, the kings of Saudi Arabia, they used to come to Ibadan for treatment. They weren't going to Britain. They weren't going to US. They weren't going to Germany. It was Ibadan here. They were taking their treatment. So what happened between that time they were taking their treatment in the pattern and the present time in there? We allow the health system to deteriorate to zero level, that nobody again want to have anything to do with us. Most of the expertise have left. So, if we are going to be stopping these young people from immigrating, we must just up our ante, raise the standard of our health system, pay the doctors, pay the nurses, pay the veterinary doctors very good money which will be as far with what they could wear anywhere in the world. And then you will be sure they won't have to leave the country again. You also have to provide security, because security is very, very important. Who is secure in this country again today? This particular question you have mentioned, I am also a victim. The only daughter that I have is on his way to Britain. He's been given a job over here. All the prison that I've made to her, all the pressure I've put to her, that she should stay in here and develop the country, that these people have not stayed back in Britain, in the US, in Germany, to develop those places. Would she have had a place to go? Would she have had a comfort zone to go and work? But the young lady has simply told me that that is not in tune with reality. But the reality of today is that uh, we, the young people, want to work in any country or in any society where we are guaranteed safety, decent jobs, and then good standards uh, of uh, living. So the onus is on the government to make sure that our health system runs the way it is run in the other developed parts of the world. All right, to Nicola Wale, there's also something on the Daily Independent, uh, top right corner, that says 2023 elections, Governor Masari reaffirms uh, support for power shift to the south. Uh, so quickly share your thoughts on that one, and how, how, much, of, um, how much importance will that aspect be uh, in the build-up to the elections? And that's, you know, with regards, you know, if the north continues to hold power, if it comes to the south, or if it even goes to the southeast, as uh, has been uh, spoken about before. Honestly speaking, I'm one of those who believe in this uh, power rotation thing. I do know that certain people and certain sections of the country are disadvantaged when it comes to holding or having access to some of these plump jobs that you have in the country. But the truth of the matter is that uh, a nation that aspires to develop, a nation that aspires to catch up with the rest of the world in the area of science, economics, politics, infrastructure, will not be talking about the rotation of presidency or any job for that matter. You will be looking for your best hands, your best brain, your best mind, your most agile individual to step into some of these crucial posts and begin to turn things around for the benefit of all Nigerians. 
whether they be Igbo, whether they be Hausa, whether they be Fulani, whether they be Kanuri, and not be thinking that uh, it should be a Yoruba man, it should be a Kalabari man. In the past, what is different as General Lucia Guapasojo made to the life of the average Nigerian Yoruba person, having health power two times? What is different as Dr. Gulo Jonathan made to the life of the people of the Niger Delta, having been president for almost eight years? What is different as Wari made to the life of the people in the North? The North is today bleeding. On that worry. So, if it has to be a matter of rotation of presidency and some of these other offices and all that, that assume that when the section of the country gets it, they will improve a lot of their people for the disadvantage of the other sections of the country. That again will be against the spirit and letters of the constitution, which says. No sections of the country, no male or female, no child or adult, to be discriminated against on the basis of the section of the country that it comes from or the background of his uh, children. We should shun this primordial attitude of saying, let's rotate this, let it be Yoruba tongue, let it be Botong, let it be a Kanuri man's tongue. It has not served us well, and it is not likely to serve us at all. If there are people who are disadvantaged, what we should do is to make sure that when any tribe is in power, when anybody is a president, we should ensure that all the amenities are equally and evenly distributed among all Nigerians. We should have a benchmark for education for all Nigerian children. We should have a benchmark for good health facilities for all Nigerian people, no matter wherever they may be in, this, in any part of Nigeria. We should have a benchmark for adequate housing for all Nigerians, whether they be Kanuri, Yoruba, or Kalabari. Absolutely. We should have a benchmark for infrastructure. We should have a program to develop the railway system, to link on our major cities, whether the cities be in the south, whether it be in the north, whether it be in the west, whether it be in the, the middle belt. That is the um, way I think. That is the direction in which I think we should be moving. All right, thank you very much. Um, and of course, I, you know, I get, I'm sure there's a lot of people who also agree with your perspective on that. Uh, but we would have to wrap up here. Thank you so much for your time uh, this morning, and we wish you a very uh, interesting day ahead. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You have a lovely week too. You too. And best wishes to my sister there. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you for joining us. Stay with us. We'll take a short break and, of course, share with you what happened on this day in history many years ago. We're going back to the year 1985 to talk about a railway rapist, as uh, he was popularly called back then. And right after that, our first major conversation kicks off. <laughs>